So I'm going to be talking about bacterial viruses, phages, and, and this is mostly sort of um, from the Ralstonia Solon Serum, our, our sort of pathogen of interest perspective. And then the team is me, uh, another co-I, Andrea uh, from, from York, and then we have great two postdocs, Friden and Sarah, working on this project um, in, in addition to the industry collaborators below. So we're interested in Ralstonia Solon Serum, bacterial pathogen that causes bacterial wilt. And basically it's, it's soil-borne disease, James already in, introduced this in, in his talk, this pathogen, and what it does, it lives in the soil. Um, from the soil, it gets to the rhizosphere and it can gain access to the plants through opening the roots. And when it gets inside the plant, it will colonize the xylem and start producing EPS, which is exopolysaccharide, lots of slime basically. And, and this, this is something that can mask uh, recognition of the plant plant immune system basically, or they then just block water circulation within the plants, causing the wilting. And then this is just short video showing growing the bacteria on acre plate. And you can sell if you tilt that, it just oozes of this exopolysaccharide. So they're super slimy bacteria. And in the UK, this pathogen causes brown potato rot. And we've been uh, studying this in in the UK, in collaboration with Ferro Science, which have been producing a nice collection of the pathogen for the past 30 years. And then on the map, you can see the areas where we collected these strains or the Ferro has collected the strains. Uh, but it's not only disease in the UK, it is very widely spread. So you can see that on the map there, bottom right, uh, all, all the sort of yellow uh, dots there are, are uh, observation of Ralstonia. And then you can see on, on top there, uh, greenhouses or tunnel farming um, in China, where you can get really devastating crop losses by this pathogen. And it tends to be a bit more uh, severe threat in, in warmer regions of area. So uh, you know, warmer regions of the world. So cold temperature, that, it can't really tolerate cold temperature. So that's sort of our, our, our saving craze in Northern, Northern Europe. So, and then, one, one thing what makes it really difficult and notorious pathogen is that there's no really efficient control method at the moment. People have used uh, soil fumigation, for example, using methyl bromide in some cases, but it's super toxic. And then as, as we've heard, lots of the microbes in the soil are actually beneficial and required for the plant growth. So we don't want to get rid of them when we're trying to treat the disease. Um, another Another matter that makes it quite difficult to treat is that it doesn't normally live in agricultural environments. It is sort of environmental generalist bacteria, and it has lots of different uh, wild hosts. One of them in the UK being woody nightshade, which is sort of um, uh, a weed that grows next to the river network or next to the river banks um, in, in the UK. And then this leads to the uh, dissemination of the bacteria from this wild host to the water network. And the UK, the risk have been using that contaminated water for irrigation of potato, which have been shown to lead to these uh, outbreaks of bacterial wilt in here. So, so the, the fact is that even if we would be able to take care of the pathogen in the fields, uh, we have to also think about the wider epidemiology of this bacteria, how it gets introduced to the fields, and then if there's transmission between the environmental compartments and the agricultural uh, fields. Well, but they do have natural enemies, so, so the chemicals aren't really working for this pathogen, but, but they, they do have phages, uh, which are sort of bacteria-specific viruses, and, and, and these are actually abundant wherever you find this pathogen as well. And then what they are, basically bacteriophages are parasites. They encode all the directions for, for, for their own replication, but they don't have the machinery to build the parts they need to assemble a phage. So essentially they, they, what they do is they inject their instructions inside the bacterial cell. And then basically uh, bacteria don't have any other opportunity, but the, just Try, start to producing phage particles. And, and, and in this process, uh, 
one bacterial cell can produce really a loads of bacterial uh, phage progeny that can get, that, that can gain, that can then go on and then infect new cells. And you can see in this transmission electron microscope photo of, of lysed cell, and then these all small particles here are bacteriophages. So they are quite efficient killers of, of bacteria. And then we've been isolating these phages uh, from environmental reservoirs, namely rivers. So this is just showing one river uh, or site in Thames where we collected samples um, just on the centrifuge tubes. Uh, we're taking them lab. Sometimes you need to enrich the phages by using known hosts. And what you can find is that most of the uh, Dulcamara plants where we sampled contained also bacteriophages. This stretch of river is known to be infected by Ralstonia um, continuously, and it's actually banned for using as an irrigation water. But basically, you can see on here, on acre plate, we have bacteria, and all these holes here are different phage samples from different plants. And then, and the bacteriophage name comes from Greek language and essentially translates into bacterial eater, which is quite quite good name. As you can see, they can really clear up and eat away the bacteria. And we've been also trying to characterize these phages to kind of understand how diverse they are. If you can see the whole on acre plate, we can really tell how different or similar they are. And then there's a quite high diversity in, 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 the, in the river network, and we can divide them into different families based on the morphology. And we're currently sequencing the strains as well to have some more sort of genomic information about our phages. Um, so the kind of project aim we have is to kind of use these phages as a, as a biocontrol method to keep Ralstonia densities in check. And, 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 and this is just showing that these phages are part of the natural microbiome in, in many, many of the cases with plants. So this is just data from China, uh, from, from tomato rhizosphere. Uh, and this is just showing healthy sort of bacterial densities on the left and phage densities on the right. And, and basically blue lines are healthy plants and then red lines are diseased plants. What we can see is that through in time, we get increase in pathogen densities in the diseased plants. Uh, and interestingly, we see much higher density, relative de density of Ralstonia specific phages in, this, so in, the, in the healthy plant soils. So there seems to be, there might be something, something going on in the natural field. So there might be natural biocontrol taking place already. And what we can do is we can isolate the phages. We can test them in a greenhouse experiment. He's Bryden doing an experiment last year. And then we just found out and tested in a preliminary test. And then basically just proof of concept that the phages we've isolated in the UK actually work against Ralstonia. And we have much lower disease index, meaning much lower proportion of the plant is filtered when we actually add the phage into our, our, our plant's rhizosphere. And then this is just showing the same graphically where you don't when you, where you have built a plant on the left and healthy plants on the right. And we're also interested in kind of infectivity range of these phages. As I mentioned, they're quite specific. And then the problem there is that now it's hard to find phages that would be able to infect all different Ralstonia genotypes. So Ralstonia is quite diverse pathogen as well, and not all the strains are the same. And here you have uh, infection matrix where you have different pathogen strains, Ralstonia strains on rows, and different phage uh, strains on columns. And every every basically square is showing interaction. And then if you if it's blue, it means infection. What we can see is, and then here's, here's a kind of schematic on the on the right on, on how we did that on Ega plate. And then basically what we see is that some of them are highly infective, some of the phages, but they can cannot infect all the pathogens. So, so what we can do is then try to develop phage combinations where we choose one, two, five phages, for example, that would be together able to cover a wide range of different pathogen channel types and increase the sort of infectivity range of this treatment. We also have idea and an aim to turn the phages into powder or tablets. So kind of work on the translational potential of the phages. So, so what we do in the greenhouse is we grow the phage in a liquid media, we filter it out, we take out the nutrients, and then we just irrigate the plant with phage water solution. But of course, this is phages have sort of they, they have quite good shelf life in a liquid media if you put them in a fridge. Uh, but it would be nice if you can actually preserve them. 
and you could you could actually move them easily as a powder format and then you could rehydrate them and this is something we're studying with the abs biocontrol trying to see if our phages have the sort of stability if we can actually use spray training and i'm basically uh, kind of make a phage powder that could be actually made into tablet as well so you would have the powder you you mix that water and then you irrigate your plant and that would be the sort of proof for application well, but I haven't had time to talk about this, that we're also interested in how the sort of longevity of the fates are biocontrol. So we're interested in if the bacteria are able to evolve resistance to the fates. So we know that antibiotic resistance, for example, is a big problem and, and it develops really quickly. Similarly, bacteria can evolve quite rapidly resistance to the fates. So we're interested in if this happens with our phages and what might be the potential mechanisms of resistance. And we're also interested in the safety of the phages from the microbiome perspective. So we want to test, and we've been testing, if our phages we've identified are actually very specific. So specific in a sense that they would be able to infect Ralstonia, but lead other beneficial bacteria um, um, untouched. And then, yeah, thank you for the listening. There's lots of, lots of things going on, not only in the UK, but also in collaborators with collaborators in Nanjing Agricultural University, and then we'll be working there as well, and I'm doing a bit of field work and I'm extending this project. So it's it's currently quite international, and we're kind of finding finding new people all, all along to try to isolate phages, especially around the world, to create a nice phage library for future work. But that's me. Thank you.